It's almost like there's somebody a lot bigger than us around here that doing this, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 31, verse 34. What God does with the sins of his people. And I know you've heard this before, probably. And I think maybe in the past I've preached this message, but um, I thought it's good occasionally to remind yourself what he does with the sins of his people. In Jeremiah chapter number 31 and verse 34, the divine text says, And they shall teach no man every man. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them yeah. unto the greatest of them, saith yeah. the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, yeah. and I will remember their sin no more. Praise God. Yeah. Lord, bless this book, this yeah. holy word, and as it goes forth for the purpose that you intend it, yes, it will Lord. not return void. No. It will accomplish that which you please. Yes, it will prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. To uh, prepare your mind for what I'll be talking about, and I want you to think of something. The, uh, we were talking about sinners in their song a moment ago. I want you to think about the New Testament where uh, one calls another a sinner. Just think about that for a moment. Uh -huh. Now, the Apostle Paul said he was a sinner. So did the man who went before the Lord and prayed and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Yes. They call themselves sinners, but... Think about the Lord Jesus Christ when he approached and confronted people. Think about who called who a sinner in the New yeah. Testament. And you might be surprised at how that opens up a whole chain of thought. And uh, pray about that because the New Testament, you know, you can fly across it if you're not careful, skim around and miss exactly what it's trying to say to us. Uh, when you say sinner, and we're all sinners, who, nobody's trying to, uh, fool anybody tonight. Uh, you, you might have come from a big shot church, didn't know you were, but you are. Yeah. And you're in the midst of friends. You're in the midst of sinners. How do you feel about that? Uh -huh. That's where we are tonight. Amen. Right. It's not that we, uh, that we rejoice in it. It's just that we read 1 John. And I'll be, con I'll be honest with you tonight, as honest as I know how. If you do not preach from 1 John and deal with the issue of fellowship and constantly understanding the speaking and the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. You're not preaching about sin. No. You're preaching about condemnation. Yeah. Satan is the condemner. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It is a discerning ability. It's maturity and understanding the difference between the condemnation of Satan and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. They're not the same. They may be dealing with the same issue, but they're not the same. And once you begin to understand the difference in it, then you begin to understand how you deal with sin. Yeah. And there's only one who can. So these things that are given to us tonight, I'm going to give them to you because every scripture I firmly believe has more than one application. Yeah. It has a primary application. In this case, it's to the Jew because of the issue with them. The Jew, this scripture is quoted in Hebrews chapter number 8. This very scripture is quoted in Hebrews 8, and an application of it is made by the writer of Hebrews and says that your issue is with the Son of God. You've rejected him. You've been put into blindness, and now you're going to have to give an account. But God says once we make it right, once we get it settled, then your sin I will remember no more. Yeah. But it can also have an application in our own lives because we need to understand that we, can, we, we need to understand this. It's very important. Our brain will never forget, and we will, will never let us forget, what we used to be. And, of course, Satan will use it to beat you to death with it if he possibly can. But you've got to remember one thing. God no longer sees you as what you used to be. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's important because it has to do with our identity. Everyone, I don't care who they are, this is why you have generation after generation after generation. They all have their music. They have their clothes. They have their icons. They have their heroes. And it's their generation. They identify with their generation. On it goes. But they... Look back with awe on the fact that the generation that follows them has their own music and their own, their own uh, you know, icons and heroes and, and on it goes. I mean, the music that we played in 1964 is nothing like what they play today. Not, a, not at all. 
But if you get on YouTube and let some of these kids today play some of that music that we listened to back in the 60s, they are amazed at the difference, and you would be amazed at how many of them like that music of the 60s. It's different. Amen. Why? Different spirit, different generation. So that's what we have. He remembers them no more. In the book of Psalm, chapter number 32, in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man, or blessed is he whose transgression, transgression is forgiven, whose yeah. sin is covered. Now, my good works cannot cover my sin. No. I, my, my mean well cannot cover my sin. Never. You can tell me it's covered, and that doesn't cover it. No. So what covers your sin? The blood. Only the blood of Christ. The blood. Only the blood. But uh, I want you to notice carefully, the 32nd Psalm is the Psalm of a man who has gotten it right with God and he has repented and his joy has come back. Uh, yeah. Brother D.L. Moody, how many's ever heard of him? Well, Brother Moody has a Bible that has been published on Logos and maybe other places you can find this. And it's all the notes in his Bible, the preaching notes, and it's amazing. It's a preacher's gold mine. <laughs> You know, preachers are always looking. Don't, don't, don't let them hem all with you. Preachers are always looking for something, and if they hear something, and so forth and so on. And D.L. Moody has outstanding notes, and here's what he says about the 32nd Psalm. He says there's seven steps to blessedness of forgiven sin. Number one is conviction. He's convicted of that sin. That's a good thing. I'm not saying condemned. I'm saying convicted. And then the second thing is confession. He confesses his sin. And then the third thing is forgiveness, verse number five. And then the fifth thing is prayer. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Then comes protection because now that one is in fellowship with the Lord and guidance. And then finally, joy. Look what it says in Psalm 32, verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. I feel sorry for these folks that have to spend hundreds of dollars to go over here on the river and shout. Doesn't cost me a dime. All I've got to do is open the Bible and let God speak to myself. Amen now, folks. Amen. And joy rises up in the soul. How many of you know what the joy of the Lord is? It's okay to be happy, but happy has to do with the English word hap. And hap has to do with circumstances, a place, a time. But joy of the Lord in the face of unspeakable this or unspeakable that, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and it's a wonderful thing. The third thing it does with our sin, he removes them as far as the east is from the west. That's pretty well. That's, that's quite a ways, don't you think? That, that's to separate them. Psalm 103, verses 7 through 11, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. No. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Oh, yes, he had much rather be merciful and gracious, long-suffering. And how many tonight has he been merciful and gracious and long-suffering? He's probably been more long-suffering with me than anybody. Because from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, I've been a rebel, but thank God for his grace. Amen. He removes it as far as the east is from the west. Another thing he does with the, your sin, he casts them behind his back. Isaiah chapter number 38, verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Yeah. This implies the fact that God wants to go on with you. Right. There's a future with you. Yeah. God's got a future for you. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to get that across to people who've failed and fallen and been stomped upon, sometimes by their friends, is to think that they could ever have anything any, again, that they could ever have another life, that they could ever have joy, that they could ever have any reason to want to continue on. That's just why we have so much, so much, so much, so much self-killing, suicide. We have so much of it today. And then teenagers and kids are killing themselves. My, my, my. 
We can put a man on the moon, but we can't give him a reason to live. Right? Sure. Sure. But I have a purpose, folks. I've told you tonight, my life is, my life is, my life is fulfilled. I'm happy. There's joy in my soul. I'm doing what I know that I should be doing. I'm answering the call of God. Now what about you? You come to church and you hear the preaching and then you go home and you, I don't know what you do during the week. I hope that you read your Bible and I hope you do some praying in the week. Yeah. Maybe even listen to some good preaching or singing. Yeah. Then you come back to church on Wednesday night, come back to church on Sunday, and you take in and you go home and you take in and you go home. But what are you doing? That's not, the Christ, that's not what this is about. No. You see, this is, this is part of your Christian life, but there needs to be another part. You. you need to be talking to people. Right. You need to be witnessing for the Lord. Amen. Here's what you ought to pray. Try this prayer. God, give me somebody in my life that I can help. Bring somebody into my, into my life, around me, somebody I work with, friend, whatever, family member that I can help. And then begin to pray for them. And then begin to minister to them. And have the Holy Ghost begin to move out of you into, into, in, into a sense where he's communicating with them. You don't have him shut up and quiet inside, locked up. You might be surprised how that once you begin to let the Spirit of God move through you and from you to somebody else, you'd be surprised what that will add to your Christian life. Amen. That problem is that you, a lot of Christians are like the Dead Sea. Did you know there's 23 different types of fish that live in the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias? Yeah, 23 different kinds. We went over there one time on one of our tours, the Holy Land. They took us to a kibbutz, kibbutz. And we went and sat down, and they brought out soup that they had made from a fish that they had caught in the Sea of Galilee. And it was, it was fish soup. And they had the fish, and they had the head, and they had the whole body. And some of the women, I looked down at them, and they were sitting there, and they were looking down at that head. And they thought, am I going to eat this? But it was delicious. I mean, it was good. It was good, good, good. I didn't eat the head. <laughs> didn't eat the head. But the, but, but the fish was good. Yes, the Sea of Galilee is full of life. Fishermen fish it. Peter was a fisherman. But that water snakes its way on down south and it comes into the Dead Sea. That's right. That's where it stops. Where does it go from there? It goes up into the air. It evaporates. And as it evaporates up into the air, it leaves the mineral content behind. The Dead Sea is much saltier than the Atlantic Ocean. Did you know that? You can walk out into the Dead Sea, sit down, and just sit there in the water and float. Just sit there because the saline content is so much it's uh, buoyant, holds you up. But God doesn't want you to be buoyant holding up because a lot of Christians are like the Dead Sea. You take in and you take in, you take in, you take in. You don't give out. And what happens? If you don't let it come through you to someone, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Why don't you make a commitment to Christ tonight to talk to somebody about the Lord? Why don't you ask him to give you a burden for somebody? Folks, I, there are people right now I'm praying for that I've God, I know God was in it. This morning when I was praying, I felt when I started praying for a certain person, I felt something moving in me. That's the whole, I knew right then the Holy Ghost was listening and he's going to do something. I knew it. I knew it. I knew I had entered into intercessory prayer. And I thank God for a time like that. Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? That's important. Because so many Christians, they take in, take in, take in, take in, but they don't give out. So he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. This is a forgiven sinner, Psalm 103, verse 12, and cast them behind his back. In other words, let's go on, he says. Don't wallow in pity. Don't sit around crying for yourself, licking your wounds for a wasted life. Put the, ba the past in the past and go on with the Lord. Go on with him. Well, you say the church that I go to won't let me forget what will get out of it. <laughs> Amen. 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 Leave it behind. Amen. Yeah. Get out of there so fast there'll be a vacuum when you go through that back door. Say, see you later, alligator. <laughs> yeah. If you want to stay in your self-righteousness, you go right ahead. Heard a man say the other day, Leah Lawson lets homosexuals come into his church. Boy, what a thing to say. 
What a thing. Let me ask you a simple question, friend. If a man has a problem with sex, where do you think he ought to go? Where do you go to get help? If you're a fallen down drunk or you're a drug addict, where do you go? Do you run to the secular authorities to get help or do you come and listen to the word of God? There's a vast difference, folks, and you ought to be able to, this is simple stuff. There's a vast difference between appointing someone who is in perversion and who's living a loose life as a leader of people, putting them up before people and saying, this is the way, no, no. And then saying, well, you can come to church. I don't know where you came from. I don't know who you were with last night. But there's a seat here for you because you need to hear the word of God. Amen, Amen. Amen folks. Amen. Amen. That's the difference. Who knows? We had a, had, had a bunch of people in here this morning. Who knows, man? Who knows who are sitting out there listening to the preaching? But this is the kind of garbage that goes on today. The kind of garbage. You judge somebody who comes through the door, no, you're welcome. You're welcome. You say, well, I'm a murderer. Well, all right. We have some murderers in the Bible that got saved. Amen. Saul of Tarsus Amen. was. Yeah. yeah. But he got saved. Yeah. Amen. This is why you can go down to death row on the bend down there. You can go into prison anywhere, and you can open up the Bible and say, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. The blood of Christ, God's Son, cleanses it from all sin. Yeah. Yeah. Man, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. Religion wants to take that hope away and keep you beaten to death. It wants to keep you under condemnation. Like I say before, there's a vast difference between condemnation and conviction. So he cast our sins behind his back and says, go on. And I'm going on with him, Lord willing. I'm going to go on with God tonight. Go on with him. Look forward. This is a little testimony. Listen to this. Once the heroin and crack addiction turned me into a homeless prostitute. This young woman talking. She says, I was addicted to heroin. I was addicted to crack cocaine. It turned me into a homeless prostitute. I pretty much gave up on life. Laying there in a bed, just staring into this mirror, I would sometimes see the beautiful little girl I used to be looking back at me. People can get there. Now, if you were talking to that young woman tonight, what would you say to her? What would you say to her? I'd say this to her. I'd say, well, you're in a place where a lot of people have been. What has happened to you has happened to a lot of people. You're not alone in it. But let me tell you something. I'm not in here to condemn you, young lady. I'm in here to give you hope. I'm in here to, I'm in here to tell you about somebody that can take that away from you and raise you up and give you a reason to live again. He can forgive you and cleanse you and he can wash you white as snow. Amen. That's what you say to them. If you take their hope away, shoot them. You might as well die. If you have no hope, well, you, that's fatalism, folks. That's what hope, with no hope is fatalism. What's fatalism? Fatalism means that the chart of your life, the course of what you're going to be is already laid out and you're headed down and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. That's fatalism. Amen. Lord Jesus says, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden. and Learn of me. Take my yoke upon you for I'm meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your souls. He never turned a sinner away. Never turned one away. Some of them turned away. But he never turned one away. Amen. The look forward for the forgiven. The look forward. Then he says in Isaiah 44, 22, he blots them out. I've blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, a cloud thy sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed thee. This we get into a book. Moses said, Lord, if you're not going to forgive them, blot me out of your book. It took a lot of... <laughs> Took courage to say that. Martin Luther was a German uh, monk. Yep. And uh, Martin Luther, you know, he put the 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg, selling of indulgences and all the rest of that. Right. And so he fell out of favor with the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, Used to be a monk, so forth. But uh, Martin Luther got into the idea by reading the scripture that the just shall live by faith. Yes. And the book of Romans got a hold of him. 
And so he, his life was turned around because he had a personal encounter with God, and he got saved. And then Martin Luther translated the Bible into the German language. Yeah, I gave them their Bible in their language. Old Martin Luther was something else. He, he, was, he was quite a character. But here's what they say about him. The people that were contemporaries of Martin Luther, they said, never heard a man talk to God like that man. Said you could be in the house and hear him, and he'd say, now, Lord, how come? I did what you told me to do. Where you at? What's going on here? He'd talk to God just like he'd talk to you. Yeah. And said Martin Luther was quite a remarkable person because it's, he feared God, he respected God, he loved the Lord. But he talked to him as if he was standing right there with him. Yeah. If Martin Luther took the idea, well, now, here I am, Lord, now let's talk about this thing. Yeah. And that's the way he talked to God. You know something? I don't know if I can find a whole lot wrong with that, can you? I'd rather have man talk to God than to have him, now our heavenly father, our great sovereign of the universe, and Lord that just spun out everything. Oh, you shut up. Let's get somebody that can get somebody to get a hold of God and pray. Amen. God's not interested in your flowery high talk. He just wants you to talk to him from your heart. That's why it's so easy. You don't have to be a theologian to talk to God. You don't. Just talk to him from your heart. So he blotted it out. And that's what Moses said. Take my name out. Didn't make God mad. God said, I got my man. That's right. He got my man. He wants to keep you in bondage. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verses 18, Now the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, yeah. to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee. Yeah. And then he closed the book because the day of the Lord was coming, approaching quickly. Right. The Lord Jesus Christ made it clear. He said, I came to help people, came to save them, came to deliver them, came to bring them up out of the pit. Satan wants to keep you in bondage. He wants you to, he wants to lie. He's a liar. He's always been a liar. Uh, do, you know what a, do you know what kind of a world a liar lives in? He lives in a fake world because he lives in a world of lies. And lies are fake. There's no reality to them. It takes a lie to support a lie. There's no end to the lie. He must continue to lie. And so if you are a liar, you are, you are so, what's the word for it? You are so weak that you can't deal with reality. So you create your own reality and you live by your lies. And Satan's a liar, deceiving himself. He's a liar, was a liar from the beginning, abode not in the truth. He told him in John 8, 44, he said, you are of your father the devil, you're liars. And so Satan wants to keep you in bondage. So what do you do? You break the lie, you say, listen devil, I'm not what I used to be. Christ died for me and he paid the sin debt. He washed me in his blood and he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You remember what I said about 1 John? The number of times liar shows up in that book. For that little book, five chapters, liar, 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 liar. And the final lie is, 1 John 5, 17, if you believe not the record that God gave of his son, you are a what? You're calling God a liar. That's exactly right. You're telling him to his face he's a liar. God's not a liar. Satan's the liar. And the Bible says in Micah 7, verse 19, what does he do with your sins? He casts them to the depths of the sea. Yeah. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Yeah. Here's what Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown says. Never to rise again to view, buried out of sight in eternal oblivion. Not merely at the shoreside where they may rise again. They're gone forever, cast into the depths of the sea. We have two great seas in this world, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. They merge at Cape Horn. They collide Cape Horn. These two oceans come together. And it's one of the most, uh, oh, I don't know, you just, there's, none, there's no peace there. It's swirling, bing, winds turning. These oceans 
collide. The Atlantic Ocean is saltier than the Pacific Ocean. They're not the same. They're different oceans. An ocean's a powerful, powerful thing. Seventy percent of this earth is covered by oceans, by water. And of that 70 percent, folks, 80, depending on who you're reading, 80 to 85 percent of it has never been explored. How easy it would be for God to reach down into the depths of that darkness and pull up a whale to swallow Jonah and send him back down. Oh, how smart these people think they are that a whale, that's the whales they know about. What about what resides deep, deep down in the deep? God said, that's where I'm going to put your sins, into the depths of the deep where nobody has ever been before. Amen. Can you imagine living on a planet where 70% of it's covered by water and 80% of that is a place where nobody can go? 13,500 feet below sea level. God bless their hearts and God bless the family that lost their loved ones. God bless them. I've prayed for those people. God bless them. 6,000 pounds per square inch. 6,000 pounds per square inch. That's at 13,500 feet. What happens when you go five miles down the Mariana Trench or somewhere like that? In plain words, it's inaccessible. You can't get to it. God said, that's where I put your sins. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 33, verse number 8, I will cleanse them from their iniquity whereby they've sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they've sinned whereby they have transgressed against me. He pardons the sins. Pardon's a good thing because it has to do with a legal term. You broke my laws. You rebelled against me. You turned on me. You cursed me. You lived a godless, profligate life. But I pardon you. You're free. How do you do that? You do it because you can stay legal by doing it through Christ. He's just and the justifier that believes on Jesus. He never yields his holiness nor his sovereignty nor his righteousness one time because through the Lord Jesus Christ, he's able to do all these things and still be just because the sin debt's paid. How many has been pardoned? Amen. You ever been locked up somewhere you appreciate a pardon? Amen. Pardoned. And finally, finally, and this is quite remarkable when you think about this one. What's the last thing that the Lord does with our sins? Well, here's what it says in Jeremiah 50, verse 20. In those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall not shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. In other words, they will be sought for and cannot find them. Now, I know the good Lord. You don't think he couldn't find your sins. But he says they are in a place where they cannot be found. They're gone. He can't find them. Think of all the things that happens to your sins. And think about Satan who would like to keep a record of every last one of them. Every one of them. So he can bring them up and dangle them before your face. Who do you think you are preaching the word of God? I know where you were 40 years ago. Who do you are here singing in the choir? I saw what you watched on TV last week. What are you doing around here teaching Sunday school? I heard that telephone conversation. Man, is it quiet in here tonight. Lord have mercy. (laughs) So what do you do, preacher? If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. How many of you do things that you know aren't right and you wind up doing them anything? Here's why. You underestimate the power of the old man. You underestimate his power. You got an enemy, folks. He follows you all day long. He listens to everything you say. You can't hide from him. You can't get away from him. You can't block him out. You can't lock him up somewhere. You're stuck with him. And he's going to be right there hounding you until you take your last breath on this earth. You know who he is? It's you. So who's your greatest enemy? You. Self. Me. Me. I'm my greatest enemy. 
Yeah. So how do I deal with that? The Bible said crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. Bring it into subjection. How do you do that? Identify it. You cannot, you will never defeat your enemy until you identify your enemy. Right. Amen. Amen. Until you know who your enemy is. Yes. So who's your enemy? Well, your enemy is far more you than it is the devil. If you'll get out of this attitude, it'll help you greatly. What's that? Blaming the devil for everything. Yeah. Now, believe me, I'm not an apologist for the devil. He deserves all condemnation he gets. But folks, an awful lot of what you do has nothing to do with the devil. It has to do with your old nature. Amen. Amen. The old nature. And as, as, as it's been said before, and I don't, I don't, there's no way I can see to improve upon it. The one you feed the most, Amen. The, one you, the one you deal with the most on a spiritual level and bring before God, that's the one that becomes dominant in your life. You feed the new man, you walk in fellowship with the Lord, you read his word and you pray, and you do these things that are pleasing in his sight and get a burden for somebody, a burden for a soul or a burden for somebody in need, then you'll grow in grace and knowledge and you'll walk in fellowship and you'll have joy and you'll shout. But if you sit around all week long and just feed your flesh, feed your flesh and say, well, praise God, I believe in eternal security. <laughs> you know, and on you go. If you do that, then you'll have a warfare going on and it will destroy your very life and it'll take you from this earth early. I firmly believe that. Those I love, I chasten, scourge every son that I receive. Amen. Live for the Lord. It's the best life there is. Amen. You won't live a perfect life. No, you won't. But you'll live in fellowship. Yes. You know, go back and listen to what I've said from 1 John. Live for him. Love him. Trust him. Talk about him. Brag on him. Amen. Love him with all your heart and all your soul. And you'll be a surprise at how, what a difference it's going to make in your life. And turn off the garbage. Good night. I mean, turn off the junk and get something good into your heart and into your soul. Father, in thy name I pray, bless your word tonight. Thank you that we can come into your house. Thank you for the goodness, the goodness of the Lord. And we have that tonight. And I, Father, thank you that I no longer give an account. Heavenly Father, I am no longer condemned. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, you say. And I thank you for that, and you have forgotten what I used to be because that's past. I'm a new creature in Christ. I don't have to approach you as a slave to sit at a table. No, 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 no. I approach as an honored guest, as a son, at the table of his father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, what have we got?